Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dying Time is here. That's right, we're talking Blood Rage on Kill by Kill. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hill, coming to you once again from Jacksonville, Florida, the spookiest place in it's not, I don't even know if it's on the panhandle. I don't know, Florida. I'm like Bugs Bunny. I'd like to saw it off of the continent. This is the Kill by Kill podcast, where we are dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. We're going to unpack all the goriest of details of Blood Rage, a.k.a. Nightmare at Shadow Woods, a.k.a. Slasher, a.k.a. Louise Lasser's promo reel, in the hopes that uh, a young collegiate's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we can make at their expense. And as always, there's only one person that I trust that if I need to make a phone call to an operator, she'll stay with me right up until the point I phoned the wrong person. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm good, but we just need to clarify one thing. I want to make perfectly clear Mm -hmm. that that is not cranberry sauce. (laughs) Well, if only someone could reiterate it and just make sure that I get the very idea that it isn't cranberry sauce when it so plainly looks like it, Gina? Well, you know, it's not it's it's you know, not unusual to find a machete covered in cranberry sauce. So you <laughs> so you, you you need to clarify that just just to make certain that we're all on the same page. That that's well, not you cranberry didn't have sauce. Thanksgiving at my house, Gina. Let, let, <laughs> let's put it that way. It was tense. Anyways, uh, I don't want to scare you, Gina, but we are not alone. That's right. We have a special guest. He is the preeminent James Bond watch expert here in America. He's also the editor-in-chief of Fangoria and a returning champion here at Kill by Kill, the one, the only Phil Nobile Jr. How are you doing today, Phil? I'm good, Patrick. How are you? I'm so wonderful and happy and thrilled to be alive. It's a new day. Oh, fuck. I'm tense as hell, man. I'm tense as hell, Phil. Listen, it's going to be fine. We're all going to be fine. Just got to play that long game. Mm -hmm. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of mantras. So I was real smart and I scheduled this recording for the day after the election, which we assumed that, you know, we would gather a picture slowly and a picture is gathering that we might enjoy, but we don't know for sure. So if if we seem like um, we are gnawing at our fingernails, no, that is the reason why. Phil, you are now uh, yet again the editor-in-chief at Fangoria. You are a champion for many films in the horror's forgotten canon. And one of them happens to be this motion picture. When I presented you with an array of what was coming up, you immediately said, Blood Rage is mine. Yes. Why Listen, do you love this movie? I'm an, I'm an old man, and, uh-huh. and, uh, and I've, seen, I've seen my classics, and I've seen my classics over and over again, and I can recite them back to front, and that's great. But like at this point, I want to see movies that are new to me. I want to mm-hmm. see movies that are weird and, and outsider art and left field. <laughs> and, uh, and just you know, like, I, like I said earlier, there's a different color out of the crayon box and, and oh, yeah. blood rage is all of those things. It absolutely. You're is. not wrong. <laughs> you are I'm not never wrong. wrong. I'm frequently not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will, I will say uh, upon this rewatch, because I think the first time I I had seen it was this beautiful package that Arrow put out. Of yes, it. God bless and Arrow. Arrow had done this amazing job with the Mutilator, which is a movie that is in my like undiscovered canon. Like I once I saw that, I'm like, oh, this is I love everything about this. And I had. And I think the first time I watched it, I had the mutilator in my head. And this doesn't, for me, doesn't quite match up to the mutilator's heights. But then again, there are moments in it which I continually laugh out loud at its pure outrageousness. Yes. Uh, Well, they're both set in fall. This one doesn't have as catchy a a fall-themed tune as the mutilator. Granted. 
Um, but, and they're both, I guess, regionally made. Um, yes. You know, East Coast jobs. Yeah. Um, real quick, though, there, like there's a personal connection. And this is like, it's going to be hard to explain. But if you ever get really high, sure. not, not saying you guys did, but maybe you did. <laughs> you ever get really high and you're like, you think you're dreaming. And then you're like, oh, I'm not dreaming. Uh-huh. My first experience with Blood Rage was it, it was sprung. It was unleashed upon me by the good folks at Exhumed Films, which is a Philly outfit that runs 35 millimeter repertory screenings. And they, uh-huh. they unspooled uh, Blood Rage. And I'm sitting there. I'm in my 40s. I have not heard of this movie. I've, it is, the Arrow thing was a couple of years away at that point. Uh-huh. And it opens on an establishing shot of the Route 35 drive-in, which is the movie theater <laughs> where I saw my first movie when I was a child. Oh, my goodness. And the movie where I saw everything from the age of 3 to 14. <laughs> it's so wow. so strange that they would shoot these exteriors at the drive-in I grew up in because the rest of the movie is made in Florida, but the Route 35 yeah. drive-ins in New Jersey and it was very uh you know by by the time the thing was filming you would think I would have heard that there was a horror movie being made at my drive-in but uh I was not but it was very weird to watch Ted Raimi in the bathroom where I peed as a child <laughs> sell condoms to a a a uh a a soon to be late individual in the film's opening credits <laughs> It was just weird. I'm in the theater and I I didn't know what happened for the next 15 minutes because I was like, this, this is the fucking drive-in I went to as a kid. It was really strange. Condoms are safety pinned to the inside of his jacket. Yeah. As a small business decision, I think (laughs) using small, sharp instruments near condoms is a bad business move, but I mean, like, listen, uh, no shade, but probably Sam is the smart brother, right? (laughs) (laughs) He also, the good news is he has a large variety. I mean, I don't know how they got him to do this necessarily. They're like, listen, we have a role. It's basically Damone, but you don't talk. And he's like, I'm in. Yeah. Well, I cheated a little. I listened to the commentary track. Oh. Uh, and the director says that that whole drive-in sequence was filmed by another gentleman named Michael Miller, who I think was a friend of Ted Raimi's. Who, so he like brought Ted along for his little adventure. <laughs> So this movie essentially had three directors because I know the producer also directed portions of it. Yeah. And the director uh, really goes pretty out of his way to put all a, a lot of, uh, let's say, choices on the producer. I believe her name is Marianne <laughs> Katner, um, yes. who also plays the, this uh, hospital psychiatrist. Yeah. Who, who has the only piece of voiceover in the entire movie for a brief period of time. Yeah, I was like, wait, okay, it's just narrated? <laughs> it is for those three minutes yes <laughs> well you can just sort of read between the lines on that she was watching that she's like i don't i don't like how this scene is i don't like my performance here you know what we're gonna voice over this whole thing yeah that yeah. whole sequence no, it, is not in the other cut of the film by the way this movie is oh, much I more see. confusing in the other edit but yeah <laughs> that's what this movie needed is more confusion yes. um so let's uh begin at the beginning this opens in New Jersey at this drive-in movie theater, which is it has a title called The House That Cried Murder. How has no one stolen that title? <laughs> For uh come on, what, like that's just sitting out there. That's a check laying on your table. Pick that up and run with it, people. The house that cried murder? Like that's half your financing right there. Take that to con. You can sell that, you can pre-sell that title at AFM for sure. Yeah. That's way um, better. That's way better than see you next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> 100 percent Uh and we open on a gentleman whom we don't really learn a lot about other than he loves popcorn. He loves putting it in his mouth and he loves cut off sleeves. <laughs> Which is a fashion forward choice for the 1974 set prologue, let's say. Yes. Yeah, Ever- that, that was that was puzzling as about as puzzling as when the uh one of the twins goes back to his childhood bedroom and there's a Yoda doll in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what year is that? You know, I would I would call that a demerit, but his mom is Louise Lasser and all bets are off. Well, yeah. That's true. <laughs> that's true. She's just ripping some holes in the time space continuum. So you never know. Yes. No, she, everything gets a little, uh, timey wimey when she's on screen. So, and as weird as that Yoda head is, I found some weirder shit in that bedroom scene. I mean, I love a good horror movie bedroom and that 
that scene has it all. But before we go there, we have to talk about this guy's decision to bring popcorn into a public bathroom. (laughs) Go to the bathroom before you buy your food and drink stuffs. This is just a little hint from us here at Kill by Kill to you, the person who can't go to a movie theater, but probably can go to a drive-in if you're lucky. Don't take your popcorn into the bathroom. It's just a bad idea. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I, 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 I can't claim that I've never done that. <laughs> Listen, no one here is claiming they're perfect. We just need yeah. to learn from our mistakes. That's what and I And if tell you my find yourself in there, time. you pop the, the popcorn can sit right on the top of the, the sort of the chrome plumbing of the urinal. <laughs> it will perch. It will perch there. And the spray radius is, you're pretty safe. Is but what I'm the saying. poop vortexes. Remember when we oh, learned about yes. poop vortexes, Phil? Remember March when poop vortexes <laughs> became a real thing that I March. had to learn about? Who remembers well, March. Many, many things have gone away, but I remember the poop vortexes and I will never forget them. <laughs> We're pretty um, ever so young and green. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so uh, during, at this drive-in, it is populated exclusively by people who either do want to make out or people who do not want to make out. <laughs> uh, and a lot of very stone individuals reaching over and giving it a go. Uh, one of these happens to be a man in a, in a shirt that is not... It's not natural fiber. Let's put it that way. It's <laughs> the most unnatural fiber next to it being made from a ghost that well, I no, could possibly Nobody imagine. was wearing natural fibers in the 70s, Patrick. Very true. So it's it's time appropriate. Also, time appropriate is Louise Lasser, who outside of the 70s, we never hear from again outside of this movie. Um, Louise Lasser, let's just... <laughs> She, we, she's got this like I, I mean I'm pretty sure that she was in this movie under the impression that it was an entirely different movie oh because yes. she she's got this like kind of 50s hairstyle and I'm like <laughs> she's supposed to be a teenager in this scene and then I'm like no she's got her kids with her for some reason but she's yeah. at the drive in making out like she's like 16 She's like, but she has a hairstyle through the majority of it that reminds me of like Little Miss Muffet. Yeah, she and then she's got yeah, she's got these like you know these ringlets later <laughs> in the movie. She's get, like, whatever happened to Baby Jane? Yeah, <laughs> you, get, you get the distinct sense that the director kind of let her fly uh, <laughs> on on a lot of choices, and, and you know that's true of so many of the performances in the film. But weirdly they all end up rowing in the same fucking direction. And I I don't know if that's the direction anybody wants to go, but (laughs) there's a weird cohesiveness to the just completely artificial sort of human behaviors that are like coalescing in this film. But let me correct you real quick because Louise Lasser was a very celebrated actress in the 70s and continued to get work. Uh, uh, Frankenhooker, I'm going to throw out uh, Requiem for a Dream. Believe it or not, she worked with Aronofsky. She worked with Woody Allen. Well, she, I mean, she was married to Woody Allen. So, I mean, so she's, he had to. She, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's part of the contract there. She was um, on HBO's Girls. She, she, she kept working and, and she's not always like this. But she had a reputation for being like this. Like when she was on Saturday Night Live on that first season, she refused to interact with almost anyone in the cast. Yes. She just, she wouldn't do scenes. She just wanted to do like, Irene Ryan monologues on stage. And they're like, this isn't the way we do this. And they didn't even know how to do that show yet in that first season. So she was, you know, depending on whom you talk to, the first person to ever be banned from coming back (laughs) to Saturday Night Live. And they had two other cast members in the following season of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. So it's not like people there didn't like that show. No, they just pretty baller to get banned from SNL. Yeah, it, well, come on. So is this her, <laughs> her most, her most unleashed, her most unreined in, like she did yeah. sitcom. She was great on taxi and she knew she, like, if you watch her sitcom work, she just, she knows comic timing. She knows how to work with others, mm-hmm. but she is just let off the leash here. Yeah. And, and there's a real ad lib vibe to every scene she's in. <laughs> yeah. It's, it like, she, it's like, a, she's doing an audition reel for a John Waters movie. <laughs> 
a John Waters movie that I think she would have been great at. Oh yeah. yeah. All being told. Uh, but I, I suppose he even looked at it and said, you know what? I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> Kathleen <laughs> Turner for me. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Listen, if I'm going to deal with the diva, she's going to, with a deep voice, I'm going to go Turner. And I think he got it right in that particular circumstance. Yeah. Never questioned John Waters. Um, in the midst of this makeout session, she's very concerned about these two kids of hers, these twins that are in the backseat of this station wagon. And turns out that they are faking being asleep. And one of them wakes up and pokes the other one and says, mom is at it again. And they make off into the night to go peep into various cars to watch people have sex. Apparently, apparently they are making out so loud that they cannot hear her children sneaking out (laughs) of the back of the car. Her makeout racket woke up the kids. I think it's I think it's the rubbing together of all those unnatural fibers. Yeah, all that the, rayon scraping. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of whirs and zings and sparks. So <laughs> uh, these two twins are on the loose, and one of them, Terry, happens to find the loose hatchet, as you do. <laughs> I stumble across a hatchet. Yeah, <laughs> just yes, you know, everyone's got a loose hatchet in their pickup truck. That's just something that happens in New Jersey. We know we watched a lot of Friday the 13th movies. He then wanders over to another uh, car uh, and he sees two people uh, literally having full on naked sex in the backseat of the car. Uh, the one guy looks up and is like, what are you doing here? Get out. And Terry takes a hatchet to this dude's face multiple times it's a a lot of face hatcheting a lot of face hatcheting a lot of gelatin blood (laughs) very much so and at one point uh terry gets a really positive assist from the lady in the car who's underneath this guy (laughs) and she pushes his head up yeah let me help you like a golf tee (laughs) yep she tees him up yeah beautiful and Terry, you know, like a great 70s ball player, you know, a Reggie Jackson, if you were, takes his swings and comes out the other side a hero. A hero because he puts that hatchet in his twin brother's hands, smears some blood on him, and goes, hey, this one just hatcheted a dude to death. Everyone come and look at him. And Todd is, you know, like your Todd's from The Simpsons just too innocent for this world and is so shocked by what has happened in front of him. He doesn't even say anything. Yeah. He just like immediately like laps into, into catatonia. Yes. He just, he, something in him snaps and he goes, bye-bye. And this is what Terry was counting on. I mean, you don't want to say that Terry is like a criminal genius, but he does get away with it for a really long time. Yeah, I don't know. It's never quite sure if if, uh, if Todd ever at some point says to anyone, hey, you know, that wasn't me. <laughs> and, 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 you know, what happened if, if, if anybody was like, yeah, well, now, come on, kid, we found you holding the hatchet. The other kid said you did it. Yeah. Like, why? That's, would good that... enough. That's good enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> All we need is one 10 year old with a bloody hatchet. All right. We don't need two. So we're going with you. Sorry. I mean, we're both, you're both covered in blood, but you're the one holding the hatchet. Yeah. And there's an eyewitness in the form yes. of Terry. Yes. And <laughs> Terry points the finger, a jacuse style, and it's all over but the races. And so as a result, we get that very Avengers Endgame moment in the movie <laughs> where it flashes 10 years later. And Louise Lasser is pulling up to visit uh, Todd. To to bring him his piece of pie. I I love that monologue Uh about how she brings him an individual piece of pie with a plastic fork and and a plate. (laughs) With a little box wrapped in (laughs) string. It's like some tennis. It's like some tragic Tennessee Williams shit. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) The menagerie. She was glass. <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much backstory going on here that we never see. We never touch. It's just her going off like ham throughout the entire movie. And to be honest with you, I'm not against it because it is probably one of the more interesting 
facets of the film. Like she is a let loose. No, but no, I don't. I don't hate it. I think she's the best part of it. I think yeah. she's the most interesting part of the whole movie. She's great, and I, I lament that we don't have uh, interviews from other folks uh, involved with the film uh, to explain why there's so many, and there's quite a few that that feel like sort of uh, after the fact sort of ideas where it's her by herself, as yeah. opposed to her interacting with other people. She's the only person that gets these solo scenes where it's like we're going to lock off the camera. I need you to make this phone call while you're pouring the wine. And I need yeah. you to ad lib this phone call. And then, okay, you know what? I got another phone call for you. And then I've got another phone call for you. <laughs> and, and and she's, she feels, it feels like she's running roughshod on this set. And yeah. the fact that the director only had one other director's credit before this and no, not another one since says to me that she was kind of just like going, going berserk on him. And he was doing the best he can. He was just trying <laughs> to stay in the saddle. He had a what? bucking Bronco on his hands. <laughs> one even wonders if they aren't alternate takes of the same scene. And he's just like, well, Let's I have this. all this Louise Lasser footage and I can't spare any of it. I just have to put it all on the screen. And then they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, because there are moments where, I mean, obviously she's decided to do a thing, which is, if she can't control life, she will control the sphere in which she lives. So she's cleaning the oven. She's vacuuming under uh, her bed with what appears to be a big gulp of wine. <laughs> Later, she's just going off on a phone call with a full glass of grape juice. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, you know, the grand finale, the, the thing that just... Once you see it, you can never unsee it. And that is Louise Lasser on the kitchen floor, just picking up corn and green beans and stuffing them into her mouth in front of the refrigerator. That, that is a 2020 mood right there. <laughs> yes. She is going through it much the way we are all at the moment going through it. Yes. And it's, uh, it's relatable. And uh, during this visit, uh, we mentioned before that the doc, uh, the doc, <laughs> the doctor's played by the producer who didn't like her role, so she put in voiceover. But we learned this is like, I don't know, Dr. Lipinski's school for children who murdered good and want to do other things good. Todd has been locked away here in this institution for all these many years, and he would very much like to get out now. And he's done with getting a piece of pie every year. He just <laughs> want, he realizes he was framed and he's fucking done with it, y'all. I think it's worth pointing out that it's got one of my favorite how they do how they differentiate twins when they when they're working on a very low budget. Uh -huh. I, I was thinking in terms of how this is amazing released. performance. Is that what you're about to say? <laughs> transformative uh, play in yeah. front of the camera. A man owning two roles. Is that the device that you're about to refer to? Uh, I, I was going to say that one of them has his hair combed forward. Oh, the other well, one yeah. has his hair combed back. Sure. That too. I guess. Yeah, if you want to be reductive, sure. You could explain <laughs> it. That, uh, and that, for some reason, Todd's hair always looks wet. Yes. Well, well he's, he's very sweaty. He's, he's sweating out some benzos. <laughs> <laughs> They're keeping him tame for 10 years. He's on like a light version of what Michael Myers got injected with for 10 years. He's a little underweight compared to Michael. So, you know, he's not getting those same dosages. But the other thing that differentiates them is uh, posture. Uh, Terry is upright and Todd looks like he, uh, a dog that you found eating cheese off the table at a dinner <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, function. <laughs> he's a little, he's a little scruffy. And then, of course, the aforementioned hair Terry's hair is community college up front and smoking cigs at a Waffle House parking lot and back. Whereas Todd is the 58th greatest American hero, but wet. When you've got hair that good, you use it. Well, listen, if I had a hair like that, I I'd be doing all sorts of cool things with it, mm -hmm. but I don't. Playing your own twin? <laughs> all your stuff too? Oh, all the time. Listen, I'd be living the double <laughs> life because I have all that extra time to do something like yes. that with cut to Thursday night football in America. And we watch as six 20 year old adults feign at knowing one another and getting near one another, but they don't really want to touch. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot of intimacy in this movie. <laughs> we, we, also, we also know that you can get a babysitting gig 
even though you're wearing a t-shirt with your nipples protruding through it. <laughs> Listen, yeah. it's hard to find that these days. <laughs> that that was back then, where you could get a nearly topless babysitter for the bargain basement cost of ten dollars, which is still you, too which is still too much apparently. It's still a way too much of a price for the person who agreed to that babysitting because when she hears ten dollars, her reaction is ten dollars. <laughs> it's like, yeah, she watched your infant. Uh, oh my god so, i mean it's full of people that are enthusiastic about acting but they maybe haven't taken a movement class and no. they maybe haven't you know you know had like those those moments where those that acting exercises where you sort of get comfortable with intimacy and physical you know interaction they're doing their this, best man they're this Fucking movie jacksonville what do you expect this movie could basically be summed up as louise lasser and the i don't know what to do with my arms players because <laughs> everyone doesn't know their angles. They certainly don't know their marks. They, they have a lot of trouble enunciating. Everyone's chosen a different accent and they're just going with it. And so in the midst of this football and the grandest of Dick fingers game, uh, we learned Terry kind of, uh, we can tell that something is off about him other than the fact that he's a murderer, but he's, openly flirting with a girl who isn't his girlfriend. He's very uncomfortable around these guys who supposedly worship him. <laughs> Cause at one point they're like, Oh, Terry will know what to do. And everybody seems to think it's hilarious that he has a brother who killed someone. <laughs> well, that's, that's a common jipe between friends. In the eighties, it was like that. You made AIDS jokes. <laughs> and if your friend's brother murdered somebody, you goofed on him. about it. <laughs> I was there. This is how it was. It's just how, it's very authentic. <laughs> They're very confused as to uh, as to how they they play football. Um, but what we we learn at this moment is that Terry is very uncomfortable with the fact that quote unquote mom is at it again. She's got a boyfriend. Yep. And not only that, at the Thanksgiving table. With people who have just moved into the Shadow Woods condominium community, she announces that she and this guy are going to get married. And you can see Terry's very full glass of milk begin to quiver. I, I was going to say, it's a giant red flag. There's something wrong with Terry because he everybody else is drinking wine. He's got a big old glass of moo juice. <laughs> well, he says later he doesn't drink. He's a... Uh... You know, you shouldn't trust a teetotaler is a, is a general rule. There's one thing between I don't drink and here is a very tall glass and I need to fill it up right to the tippy top with milk mm. as an adult. Drink water, you know, <laughs> you know, like a normal human being, like have a soda for crying out loud. There are, they have a juice. A juice. Uh, with juice with dinner. I mean, ter- Terry's <laughs> Terry's a golden boy. He's a golden boy in 1980s Americana. He's going to drink that whole milk. There's a lot of trophies on his mantelpiece. Apparently, he was so good at sports. He was good at every nondescript sport possible. Mm-hmm. Um, all his uh, trophies seem to be guys relatively holding their arms up, but not like a touchdown but not like they're trying to learn how to fly like in birdie. It's somewhere <laughs> in between. I'm not sure what sport it is he's so good at, but man, he fucking killed it in high school in this sport. He was the number one at trophy stealing. <laughs> we just take them. Or one of or one of mom's former boyfriends worked in a trophy shop and he's Very like, likely. hey, I got an extra one, kid. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> you were third place in the hundred yard dash. <laughs> Thanks, dad beautiful (laughs) here's the other thing about this film it's lit in such a manner that everyone looks like they're on a three-day bender there's a lot of eye bags you get to see a lot of harsh makeup lines (laughs) it's yeah they're not presented in the most appetizing of ways no they're uh it's hard the 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 actor playing terry and todd he's he's got good bone structure but but the the, the lighting and the cameras is doing him no favors. 
No, I mean, listen, it is very difficult to know one's angles. You have to see yourself on camera a whole lot. And it takes discipline to always put yourself on a mark in which you're showing the best version of yourself. There's a lot going on to being an actor rather than just learning your lines, which a good half of this cast did. So again, congrats to them. There's a lot of teeth in his mouth <laughs> in this, uh, as well. And um, in between the two haircuts, neither particularly suits him all that well. And But he is trying, like he is giving two distinct performances here. <laughs> The, the lighting, it reminds me of a low-budget filmmaker I knew who once told his crew they could only light once. <laughs> you know, and, and if, you, if you're if you sweating that under under a producer, under the under the person with the purse strings, you and you're told yeah. you got to light it once, you just turn all the fucking lights on. Yeah. And like, <laughs> here's all the lights. And, you know, that's sort of a, well, that's what that's what porn films look like. Yeah. And then well, this DP shot some, some classics uh, such as All Men Are Apes oh, and Teenage mm. Mother. Oh, all right. And, you know, so they were used to sort of like just set it and forget it. You turn those lights <laughs> on and you leave them on. Uh, and yeah. th- that's the most brightly lit dinner scene I've ever seen in a film. No, it looks like a furniture showroom. Yes. It's insane. Like, you know, every detail of that room based on what's happening. And it's not really doing anyone any favors. Uh, there are two uh, characters who suddenly ap- they appear, even though we don't know anyone here. They're just like, oh, we're new in town and we're coming over for Thanksgiving dinner. And there's uh, the hot young girl who's, ba- who's going to end up babysitting without a bra. And then her mom, who at all times looks like she's going to like turn to the camera and go, well, I talked to the doctor and it's definitely cancer. <laughs> You're not wrong. So after the football game in the other cut of the film, they all go swimming and oh. and it's a big old exposition party. And oh, okay. you learn more about the girl, you learn more about her mom, and you meet the, the single mother who she's going to babysit for. In fact, that's the scene where she says, can you babysit for me? Uh-huh. So, you know, it's not really the uh, the performance's fault that, that this shit isn't there for you. It's just <laughs> excised. Right. Well, you make three different movies, like you're going to have three different yeah. films at the end of it. But I advise you to check it out because it has the swimming equivalent of that football scene where nobody knows what to do with themselves. <laughs> I love it already. Yes. I mean, indecision plus water. Yes. Oh, all right. You convinced me. There it is. Right, you did it with the unseen. You're doing it here again. <laughs> all right. Uh, Brad is the new boyfriend. And he, like all men in this movie, needs to put their tongue down Louise Lasser's throat. It's something about she's, her, the way she, is, she smells. She is some sort of like sexual dynamo because <laughs> men cannot keep their hands off of her. They yeah. just got to get a piece of Lasser. It feels like and that they, like they, they see that brown lacquer on her teeth and they're like, let me, <laughs> let me see if I can get that off. <laughs> can I, That's got to come I, off, right? Right. Can you suck nicotine <laughs> off of a tooth enamel? I'm let me give try. it a twirl. Yes. You're yeah, like, oh my 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 you know, my psychopathic son has escaped from a psychiatric hospital. Oh, let's not worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all this okay. escaped mental hospital son talk is making me turgid. <laughs> <laughs> Again, after Scream, it is really weird to have yet another character go, Oh, this tragic murder in, in your history. Maybe my penis will help. <laughs> And it's like your penis never helps. Let me relax. Let me relax you a little. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let my penis help you help you. You know what I mean? Uh, and then the other thing that occurred to me every other time the the Mark Soper who plays Terry and Todd turned around in the Terry role, I just keep expecting him to say, "You are the sausage king of Chicago." <laughs> he's, Why? He's got, <laughs> Wait, why? <laughs> <laughs> because he looks like the guy in in uh, Ferris Bueller oh. who turns to Ferris and says, "You are the Chicago, the shop, the, the sausage you king of Roman, Chicago, the sausage king of Chicago." Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't seen Ferris Bueller in so long that maybe I, I'm missing that. But uh, all right. <laughs> I'm in. Well, let's, we we advise people that when it comes to references with the show, they should listen to it with the Wikipedia open just mm. so they can scroll through if they need to.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, breaking into the show very quickly to tell you all about a new podcast that I think you need to know about. It's called The Guide to the Unknown. It's a podcast all about horror. See, every week, siblings Kristen Anderson and Will Rogers discuss spooky pop culture, urban legends, and the paranormal while keeping it light and cozy, y'all. Uh, favorite episodes include, they talk about all of the Disney haunted mansions around the world. They they went to a, a seance that they attended in a paranormal bookstore. They give you the real life story behind the Conjuring movies. New episodes come out every single Friday on every single major podcast app, including Spotify. Episodes are also recorded live every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern on youtube.com slash talk bomb. So you can actually watch them record the show live or you can catch up to it on Friday. Either way, you're going to have a good time. Go to gttupod.com for all the links to enjoy the show any way you wish and follow gttupod uh, anywhere on social media. Uh, check them out. Guide to the unknown. I think you'll enjoy it. And now back to the show. Well, I was going to I was going to say that I, I couldn't help uh, thinking that I had seen this actor in something before. Mm-hmm. And I looked it up and I realized that I remembered him from a very depressing movie of the 80s called The World According to Garp. Oh, yeah. Oh, is he this? Oh, he's God. The one, he, he's the one who gets his dick bitten. <laughs> hey. <laughs> wow. Yes. Whoa. That's really him? Uh, uh, oh, my God. Mark yeah. Soper is the that, guy who gets that, his dick that, bitten off? That is him. Oh. So I, was like, I was scrolling through and, and like at uh, the top of IMDb, it's got him in Swordfish and Phenomenon in like two background roles. And I'm like, what is he, John Travolta's buddy? <laughs> He's just a or bunch is he of a Scientologist? Uh, ooh. ooh. Whoa. We just cracked I don't want to make asper- I don't want to make aspersions against him, uh, but that's a guess. We cracked it wide open. <laughs> That's what we do here. We un- we unlock a movie. We don't just discuss. We don't just discuss it. Brand decides uh, the best way to help is to go to my office and listen to a preacher on the radio, and crack open an old style. I like old Brand. style. I like it's Brand. beer, or at least beer ish. Sure. Yeah. What's the name? Of the, what's the name of the show? Was the, the 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 Christ Saves program radio program. Yeah. <laughs> like, Christ is the good old yes, boy. Christ, Christ has, ne- has never died, so we never go off the air. <laughs> is their tagline? Which, as a person who writes taglines, mm, I would keep that off my submission. I mean, it's very explaining. Just saying. And so during during this the sequence, uh, he snuck up on by Terry, who thankfully. Has several machetes <laughs> just <laughs> think, at the ready. I think this is my favorite kill. Just to see how extended it is. <laughs> how long it takes someone to realize that a guy with a machete might be dangerous. But as the bread slowly turns and says, well, look what the cat dragged in. That's when that old style gets hacked off. His entire hand goes flying and uh, the boar, the beer pours on the, the carpet as all carpets in Jacksonville, I assume, uh, have old style soaked into them. It's just part of the flavor of the area. You really got you really got to piss off our Florida listeners. Oh, that's true. My apologies <laughs> to Donkey Doug, all of the Jacksonville homies. <laughs> My apologies. Jack, uh, Florida, not high on my list right now, to be honest with you, G. Uh, well, fair, but. They, they did kind of piss me off. Uh, but then again, no one who listens to this show would be at fault for that. So I apologize to them and their families, but not their uncle, because he knows what he did. <laughs> um, anyways, he dies. We later learned that his entire head has been split open very cleanly by this machete and we get to see it in all its glory and for low budget special effects this movie is trying it's trying it's trying but not quite there it's trying it's not there no but i think it's going for something and and so in that effort like i love a goer 
And this movie is like that. Later on, the, the, uh, the psychologist slash producer of the movie is yelling for Todd because she, <laughs> I don't know, there's some sort of Long Island accent happening there. <laughs> But Todd, come out, Todd. There's a there's a T and H a W several D's. It's a lot going on. With, with her assistant Jackie, Jackie, who, Jackie, who, who, who seems like she picked him up on the side of the highway and said, "Hey, <laughs> hey, do you want to help help me find this escaped murderer?" Okay, I got a couple hours to kill. Yeah, Jackie's more like a guy you ask to help you move a couch, not find <laughs> a psychotic. You know what I, I mean? Did you notice his technique for lure, trying to lure Todd out of hiding? He's like, you want to get high? He's like, huh? <laughs> like he's patting his like little pocket of weed. He's going, Todd. He's like, he's like, he's calling to his kitty. He's like, pss, pss, pss. <laughs> you want to get high, Todd? <laughs> so like, What's this guy doing with the, with the patients at this place? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know there's, because we never see any patients because they can't afford to go inside that building. No, but there's a little, they're painting you a picture, I think, with those little <laughs> moments. <laughs> Like the, the doctor's assistant smokes weed with the patients. That tells yes. you a lot by doing very little. The, the assistant, uh, after trying to lure out Todd, uh, meets up with Terry. And Terry ends up sinking the machete into his gut uh, in such a way that he doesn't get a lot of blood on him at that point in time, which is very bold for a guy wearing a white striped shirt. Yeah. And that machete goes through like a hot knife through butter. I love when machetes defy all physical laws of, of <laughs> human physiology. It just yeah. goes right through to the hilt. We've noticed on the program that that a lot of people who make special effects are under the impression that once a knife stabs you, you don't have bones. Sure. I'm going to I'm going to just make one like defense of the special effects, though, sure. and say like this guy is at the mercy of this producer who sounded like a real handful <laughs> from the director's commentary. Uh, and, you know, Ed French is Ed French is the effects guy and he's no slouch. He's done a lot of cool stuff. He did Terminator 2. He did Sleepaway Camp. He's 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 in this movie. But he's, yeah. um, you know, he he's. He's doing a job of work, as the director says on the commentary. <laughs> the director, sidebar, the director compares himself to John Ford on the commentary track. And he goes, oh, well, you, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, he has every right. <laughs> John Ford calls certain films a job of work. And that's what this was. I was hired to do a job. I'm like, you made two fucking movies, bro. This is the last one. Uh, you know, but I, yeah, I like that he has that self-worth about it. I love that for him. Yeah, <laughs> I love that journey that he's on. <laughs> Um, another sequence, which I genuinely, every time I watch it, I laugh out loud because it's so wonderfully audacious is the cutting between Louise Lasser on the floor eating food and this producer slash psychologist <laughs> getting cut in half and just flailing on the ground and the camera pulls back and you see that the legs are far away from her doing their own thing. But can can I can I just jump in and just say, do you see her get cut in half, or is in, in my memory it just cuts back and she's in half? Yeah, yeah. it cuts yeah. back and she's, she's hollering yeah. it like you know at the POV camera, and they cut away. And the next time they come back, she is just full on Dewey Cox's brother, cut in half, real bad. <laughs> and and then and Terry tearfully or Todd try, tearfully tries to put her back together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> I think you can I think we can uh, maybe if you have some tape or do you have some crazy glue it's, not, maybe, it's not bad just stay calm put some, put some pressure on it <laughs> I'm just gonna light a map a match near it and maybe we can cauterize some of the wounds and we'll be happy back up in no time <laughs> Um, but I also love that in between the initial reveal of her and her legs being far away, that her legs, like a great undersea, unexplained sponge migration, her legs move back towards her body. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. There's a lot to love about this movie. It really is. <laughs> I'm not immune to its charms because sure. it's homemade, right? It, it's the difference between something that's a big, splashy Hollywood affair and something that's like, a, you know, a or, group of friends trying to do something. Sure, sure. But but it's, it's even weirder than that because it's it's there's still light years between this and like the worst Friday the 13th movie. You know, the, the, the Friday the 13th movies are, are operating on a similar budget, the similar cast of talent, maybe. Mm -hmm. But they just happen to know where to put a camera. 
Ha- yeah. Happen to know how to block a scene. Yeah. Uh, like these folks are, um, the, I, the word adrift comes to mind. These folks are set <laughs> adrift in front of the lens for so much of this. And it's, it's terrible and it's easy to laugh at it, but it's, it makes it unpredictable and that makes it exciting. And that makes me love yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, it's unreliable that you don't even know where your basic dialogue is going to go. You don't know where your exposition is going to go. Every time it comes back to Louise Lasser, you perk up in your seat and you, it's filler. <laughs> this is shoe leather happening right now. And you're like, this is the best part of the movie. And because, <laughs> You just have no fucking idea where Louis Lasser is going to go next. And yeah. I love that kind of just weird outsider art, regional American filmmaking. And it's hilarious. And it's, and it's not, you know, air quotes good, but it's a, it's a ride. And I, I love it for that. It's wholly unique unto itself because it's, it's attempting to be that sort of Friday the 13th and never really ever coming anywhere close. And yet there are elements of it that, you that aren't just cribbed from other movies. That whole Louise Lasser thing is not like we need to create this moment re, moment that I love from Happy Birthday to me or My Bloody Valentine. Right? Like they are trying to make their own unique version of a Halloween ripoff, and and failing not to the spectacular heights of a truly good bad, but a very watchable. What the fuck is going on? Yeah, I mean it's 82 minutes. It doesn't tax you too much it, it, on its ride. It takes it, the first 40 feel like they take forever, but, <laughs> but after that it's a it's what's the what's the killing what's the killing begins it uh yeah. it, it pick, really picks yeah. up the pace. And there's all sorts of weirdness along the way, like when the babysitter offers Terry uh, a tomato juice or vodka or vodka and tomato juice, and he goes, "I'll just have tomato juice." So she puts two pieces of ice and a glass and fills it with tomato juice. Sure. <laughs> and there's an extent, there's a, uh, a, a, uh, extended riff on a coconut liqueur. Oh, and how bizarre it is. This is not for children. <laughs> Which <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, is, is that bizarre that, that, that you know, a, 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 a you know, sweet tasting liqueur would you know, be marked not for children. Uh, based on the um, kinds of alcohols that are on that coffee table, Gina, I think, Someone listing off odd liqueurs turns that woman on. There's coconut. There's two different types of coconut liqueur. There's a coffee. There's a banana. It's just full. He pulls up one and it's fucking creme de menthe. Who just puts out creme de menthe? This whole, this whole who gets hot because of liqueurs. That's this whole a, scene is just, you know, is one thing that, that, that I, I genuinely enjoy about the movie because it just, it, doesn't have any bearing on the plot. <laughs> we don't. We don't know who these people are. No. Apparently, this is this is a man that she has brought home because she's trying to land herself a rich husband. He doesn't look rich. <laughs> well, he's an effects guy, so yeah. Um, <laughs> he is you know extremely uncomfortable with her openly hitting on him. Yes, to, to the point so. where he's sort of kind of folding in on himself. <laughs> the closer she gets to him. He's becoming the house in Poltergeist where it's exactly. just imploding. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then it's all to the, you know, in, in service of, you know, Terry can kill this guy and then kind of hang his head in the, in the doorway. In between that, you have this whole other plot where you have Karen, the girl that was going out with Terry before they went off to college and she's decided to lose her virginity to him or maybe not, maybe just... It's time for us to have sex. I'm not really sure what's no, going no. on. No, I want you to make love to me, which is like, bleh, please, <laughs> God. <laughs> it's very bold. And then you have these two other guys that um, I'm just going to call the Vinnie Barberini. They're just <laughs> one Vinnie Barberino split into two. I think one was named Greg and the other one was named Greg. I don't remember. <laughs> Small Greg and large Greg. <laughs> But also they vary at, I can't tell which one is large and small. It's, <laughs> they're basically the same out of the same mold press yeah. right down to the accent. Although uh, Artie, I guess, is is the one who's wearing the variant of the Canadian tuxedo that I'll call the Canadian Italian waiter because there's a, a, a denim vest. Well, 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 Artie is the one who gets into the, the debate with... Uh, with with Terry as to whether or not the substance on the machete is in fact cranberry sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and you will be surprised to note it is not cranberry sauce. It is in fact very 
off color blood. It's just very and weirdly clotted blood. Yeah. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's how blood interacts with the humid air of Florida. I wouldn't know. I blood only briefly the- lived there in Orlando working at the Universal Studios there. So I don't, I'm not an expert on how blood works in Orlando necessarily. I just did, I did go to Pirate Dinner Theater where they had a pamphlet that when you opened it, it had pirates on jet skis and there was a little uh, blur balloon and inside of it said, surprise, pirates. <laughs> That's not a surprise when you go to Pirate Dinner Theater. If, if you go to Pirate Dinner Theater and there are clowns, that's a surprise. <laughs> Just word of marketing for Pirate Dinner Theater all these years later. So at one point, uh, someone refers, uh, oh, wait a second, it's the makeup artist, uh, refers to Terry and the girl who doesn't have a bra on is minors. Right. And it looks like both of them have fully vested 401ks, to yes. be honest with you. they not, Neither of them look like teenagers. They can rent a car. They might be able to run for president. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty much. Um, <laughs> what else happens in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, t- can we talk about the twin twist? Because it's, sure. it's, it's a bold choice that is not a twist to hardly anyone in the film at any time, including us, the viewer. Mm-hmm. We are always fully aware which twin is which. That's, you know, that's kind of not why you do the evil twin movie. It's mm-hmm. usually, it's usually do some sleight of hand on an audience, but here it, it, it works once on Karen uh, and, yeah. it, and it works on the mom to a, to a fatal degree. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's hilarious that they went that twin route uh, and the film itself is uh, weirdly, uh, it's the same plot as a, a, an Edgar Wallace creamy, you know, those German creamy movies where they're all mm-hmm. based. There's a movie called the, the demon with the blue hand and it's Klaus Kinski as like, one brother is locked away for a crime and one brother is loose. And you find out very late in the film, spoilers for this 50 year old creamy movie that the, you know, Oh my God, we locked up the wrong brother. But uh-huh. this, this is the same plot, except they just let you in on it the entire running time of the film. And there's no subterfuge. Like at no point does it go, Oh, I got, I'll get one over on, on Terry. I'll push my hair back. Terry pushes his hair forward to try to appear to be Todd. Like no. no one ever plays with that at any point. Terry throws a striped shirt on that's a different shirt and a short sleeve at one point. So at one point they're yeah. both wearing striped shirts, but they're different striped shirts. It's never in doubt who's who. Yeah. It's very odd. Weirdly, Ed French is in that German movie too. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Wow. <laughs> Getting around Ed French. So he was in two evil twin movies. Oh, well, that there are the you same go. plot, basically. When you got an evil twin movie, well, he should have been in Doppelganger there. Have you ever seen Doppelganger? With Drew Barrymore? Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, <laughs> that, that movie takes a turn. And and that last uh, 20 minutes in that, it becomes five different movies. It's fantastic. At one point, there's uh, John Carpenter's The Thing shows up for no particular reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking wild. Yeah, so... Uh, Artie gets royally forked uh, in the neck. We get some throat slashing. Uh, that makeup guy, no wonder that head looks so good because he's the makeup guy. He did a life cast of himself. Yep. Probably did that to show off at parties for crying out loud. Uh, yeah, someone gets their throat slashed in mid-sex. Uh, and then someone just gets kind of slashed and stabbed post-sex. Uh, we get to see... A lot of Artie by the pool, but not the full Artie. We get like a three-quarter Artie. A little too much birthmark for me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I enjoy a movie which gives you a little man ass, but um, uh, again, you're not seeing their best angles, and we don't get to see his or hers or anybody's. No. And, and th- this movie also has a shower sequence, which... Um, I had just recently, because of the Shout Factory, um, or Scream Factory, rather, their new Friday the 13th set, I finally got to see part three in 3D. Congrats. And there's a lot that I now appreciate about how that film is directed that does not work in 2D, that works much better in 3D. Sure. You're kind of like, okay. Now I understand why this is framed this way, because 
that you're you're giving multiple planes to the viewer. Like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. But then I also noticed that one of the girls takes a shower with a necklace on. <laughs> Who the fuck takes a shower with a necklace on? Well, here she takes a shower. She doesn't even put a curtain. It doesn't even need a shower curtain. <laughs> You don't need to because the necklace traps the water. That's the power of the necklace. <laughs> both of these criticisms are kink shaming, in my opinion, because <laughs> uh, I enjoy both of those things. Okay. Well, I and don't mean to yuck anyone's yum. Listen, you know, right. we don't play that here. All right. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, and so uh, we get a lot of uh, push me, pull you, chase me here at the end where Karen picks up a baby. Uh, like we're <laughs> like it's a loaf of bread. <laughs> Just like not since uh, the opening of of uh, I what wait, wait, wait a second uh, Gina which fr- uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie is it where a person picks up a baby and it looks like they've picked up a four, 14 year old they're just swinging that that baby doll around. Uh, I think that's five. A dream child. Yeah. Oh man, she's like really whipping that baby around while she's running. But this is this comes close to that. Um, and so at the very end, there's a denouement by the pool. Uh, there's some subterfuge going on in the bathroom, but it doesn't really amount to much. Anyways, uh, Todd gets a chance to like, all right, I'm really gonna do something about my psychotic brother, but he can't do it again. So Karen picks up the guns, like, fuck it, I'm gonna shoot him. But the safety's on, or there's no bullets in the gun. It, it's a, really sure. I, I think it's a because they're using a cap gun. Oh, I see. I see. That makes a lot more sense. Anyways, Terry is nonplussed about this. He pushes Todd in the pool, and we get a lot of how are we going to film a fight between these two guys if it's played by the same actor? And their solution is I don't know, they're both in the pool. So at a certain point, uh, Terry gets out of the pool on the other side, and here comes Louise Lasser. She's been revving up this whole movie. She has, she has put herself in a very Meisner place. So there's a lot of sense movement, right? She's centered. She's in the moment, and she plugs Terry within an inch of his life, one in the gut, one in the head, a couple others that we don't see the effects takes of. Long, it takes him a it. long time to die. He yes. gets he gets shot in the eye. And he just like ah, <laughs> ouchie. <laughs> That's an ouchie. Again, Mom. <laughs> you shot another, my eye out. Just another unexpected choice in this gem of a film. I'm telling you guys. <laughs> you didn't think he was going to do that, and then when he did, you were delighted. <laughs> No one could see it coming, and after getting shot in the eye, neither will Terry. Hey. Oh, and so he takes a timble tumble into the pool, and we get the full "It Follows" red on blue blood explosion across the waters, which makes me wonder if that dude saw this movie and is like, "Well, I don't know about the rest of it, but I really like the pool blood." <laughs> and uh, and then <laughs> she grabs Todd like oh it's just you and I again Terry you and I and she's like it's Todd no 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 it's it's not Todd it's Todd it's It's Todd it's Todd it's Todd Todd. 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 (laughs) you think if he broke it to her more gently it would have gone different Um, Uh, this is awkward actually but if uh, he had slipped her a note or said you know just for future just heads up Todd yeah it's fine it's fine now it's fine now but Todd Todd (laughs) going forward Todd just want you to know, hair forward, Todd. Oh, yeah. I was confused because no, yeah. of the pool. <laughs> Everyone was wet. And so uh, upon knowledge of this, uh, she cannot bear it. And she done dues herself in. Uh, in a moment that you're like, all right, you've got that daytime Emmy locked. Wait a second. This isn't being released <laughs> on daytime television? And that that that's that's it. They're that's like, true. hey, Free that's stream. all we have to give. The movie, it be over. I, I, feel so, like we, I feel like we barely touched the surface, but <laughs> well, now that we are at the wrap up point, is there anything that we did not discuss that you would like to discuss, Gina? I mean, I said we we could just do a whole you know deep analysis of Louise Lasser's character, and and. <laughs> 
you know, clearly there's some sort of they don't go into the into it as much as you would think that they would, given the rest of yeah. the tone of the movie. There's clearly some weird psychosexual thing between her and Terry, but yes. you know, like like anytime you know you, know, I mean, I I can only assume that his you know deciding to to abruptly frame Todd for murder is to get him out of the way so he can have the mother all to himself. Oh, yes, and, it absolutely is. Yeah. And then, you know, she apparently is, you know, she ends up getting involved with this uh, this building manager and that just caused him to snap again. Mm-hmm. And the then, mom is at it again. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, my, my 50-year-old mom has the audacity <laughs> to, to date other men, <laughs> whereas I am a grown man and no longer need my mother's attention as much. But, but he's impotent and he can't form real relationships. And so therefore he's also psychotic. I mean, I, I was bracing myself for that, you know, come here and give mommy a kiss scene to go on a little too long. And, <laughs> and it didn't, it was weirdly restrained considering how little anything else was restrained in this movie. <laughs> it's not a movie where restraint is very high. That is for sure. I mean, it is, it is wild the what it is has come down to. I, I'm not entirely sure they fully baked the cake of why they're crazy, but they obviously are. You just don't know why or how or how they've maintained a sense of normality all this time. Because if you're really that crazy, like they're hiding it very well right up until this Thanksgiving dinner which is true of like almost every family Thanksgiving I've ever had, I guess. Sure. Shit gets wild at Thanksgiving. Things come out. Nerves are on edge. But do you think that, do you think what set Terry off is mm-hmm. the mom's engagement or Todd escaping, giving him an excuse slash scapegoat someone to pin these murders on again? <laughs> well, I think he was already, I mean, you could kind of see like, you know, the light go out in his eyes when the mom announces that they're engaged. Yeah. And then so, and then conveniently two minutes later, oh, by the way, your psychotic brother has escaped from his school. <laughs> right. <laughs> As one often escapes from a school and not even the introduction of hot bread can break the spell. <laughs> hot bread, everyone. Terrible. Hot bread. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they don't, they don't dig into the motivations because they, everyone showed up on set with the idea that we're going to make a slasher movie. And this is how you do those. This is, this yeah. is what happens in these movies. And it's a really interesting sort of uh, snapshot of how a movie doesn't make itself. But, but if everybody, you know, it's like when you're working at a shitty company and they're like, let's have a meeting and you all sit at a table and you bunch talk about a bunch of shit, but nothing gets done at that meeting, but you had a meeting. And, he, mm. and it's like they're playing house. Um, and and th- there's a, a little bit of that energy in this movie where you, they they all stood in front of a camera. And they all st- said some lines and then they cut that footage together and they said, this is a movie. Yeah. And uh, it, it's so. Th- so there's not a whole lot of deep thought happening in terms of uh, in terms of motivation or plot logic but but what becomes fascinating to dig into is how did it get to here like why did this producer want to make this film and there was there's there's an idea that she she's getting on this gravy train she thinks that slashers are going to make her some money and she also decided she wanted to act in it but (laughs) her film before this which they they show these characters watching on television was supposedly some sort of art horror movie oh and it's it's like there's an axe hap an axe murder happening but it's very like white and gossamer, you know that sh- that TV, uh, the film that they're watching on television. One scene, the yeah. film, yeah, yeah that, that's her previous work. Oh, I was wondering what that was because they give it a lot of play. Yeah, in that scene. Yeah, uh, but and then Terry goes, "Why would how does how does this even get on television?" Which is a very <laughs> good question. Yeah, uh, but I, I I love it for the just it's more like sort of the behind the scenes, just trying to read the tea leaves of how this movie came to be is sort of the fun of it for me rather than trying to like crack its code, so to speak. Of the uh, sort of that first blush of the arrow forgotten horror collection of the mutilator, this and the slayer, this is solidly in the middle for me as, Mm. as much as I enjoy, like the slayer is more beautifully photographed, but also is complete nonsense has one beautiful kill in it. And for the rest of it, it like maybe a dream who knows who cares. 
It's like, have you seen a beach? Have you seen a beach like this? And then the mutilator to me is like the let's put on a show that kind of almost works. Like it almost reaches the level of like, we know what we're doing. And sure. there's just a couple performances there that are so Looney Tunes <laughs> that you're kind of like, okay, I, I know why this didn't hit as well. And I would just wedge it right in there primarily because there's so much fascinating work going on in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess at the risk of repeating myself a little bit, I just, I just think that this is such a weird singular flavor that I've never mm-hmm. seen in a movie anywhere else uh, that, that I, it's got this shaggy dog affection uh, thing going on for me. I just love that it's that, that it's like the it's the last stop for the director for the producer. <laughs> like none of them made anything again, uh, yeah. and and that it got rescued from oblivion by probably the, some of the folks at Exhumed Films and stuff showing sure. it and whatnot, leading it for Arrow to uh, discover it again. The director, I, I, I don't have to keep harping on this commentary track, but the director has no why idea why people are revisiting this movie. <laughs> He's he it sounds it sounds like uh, when I used to work in a department store and, we, and and the security guard in the store would like bring in a shoplifter and I'd sometimes have to sit there and be a witness. It sounded mm-hmm. like when the store detective was interviewing the shoplifter. The commentary track has that kind of energy. <laughs> it's a lot of one word answers. It's a lot of I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, he, there wasn't a lot of planning involved yeah, in this particular move. Exactly. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. like, how was the how how did people get along on set? And the director's like, they got along fine. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, as so long as I don't give you the details, I can't be brought up on charges. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna you know play with the the details over here a little bit and kind of keep play coy. Yeah, he's not a real affable interview, and and and, <laughs> and it's it's to me it's the energy is such that he's just. I don't know why I'm relitigating this movie. I I made this 35 years ago. Can I please go live my life now? Um, (laughs) And, and those kinds of movies getting rediscovered is all endlessly fascinating to me. So this is, this is a, this is a special one for me. No, it's, it's one of those reasons why you pick up some of these smaller titles because you're, you're hoping for that moment of discovery. Cause that's always really fun to discover a, a movie that you have not seen before. Maybe it's just, heard or maybe you just saw the video cover of and never picked up uh that's the fun of it that's mm-hmm. why you do it it's it's neat that they're given this glossy treatment and you can see everything that forest is very well lit <laughs> it, it appears like they're preparing for the the ufo landing in close encounters of the third kind it's like <laughs> you yeah. see every part of that woods um, so that pretty much uh, rounds us up. But of course, before we go, it's time to play Choose Your Own Death Venture. And that is where you decide of the deaths presented in this motion picture. If you're forced to die in one of those ways, which one would you choose and why? Up for bid uh, for blood rage. We have hatchet to the face while doing it proper. <laughs> we have uh, hand cut off, head split in two, mid beer. We have cut in half while looking astonished. We have decapitated after drinking a small amount of coconut liqueur. We have throat slashed in mid-sex, uh, slashed and stabbed post-sex, neck forking, multiple gunshot wounds, and of course, a single self-inflicted gunshot wound. <laughs> and of course, uh, you, Phil, as our esteemed guest, I turn to you for your answer first. Gosh, you know, I think I would have to choose just for the sheer uh, absurd experience of it. I think I would want to be murdered by a little boy while I'm having sex with a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Plus you're near that, that, that uh, movie, you know, palace that you grew up yes. uh, near. And it's like Jason Voorhees going back to Crystal Lake. That's, uh, this is how I need to die. I need to make this happen. You're squaring that circle and you, you know, you get to meet Ted Raimi in the bathroom. <laughs> Who, what more could you possibly want? Your, your date hoist your head up, presents it. Yes. Like at the end of Conan, the barbarian. A helpful it's fantastic. Lover. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, yeah, I mean, we nailed it. That's it. I didn't know. I didn't know it when I started, but now I do. Okay. That's all we need to know. That works for me. Gina, what say you? Um, you know, it, it's such a, you, you don't see this used as a weapon very much in, uh, in, in horror movies. So I, I've got to come out for the, the serving fork to the neck. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's really that, uh, Vinnie Barbarinite. 
is very astonished at that serving fork being part of that, that group of utensils. He's like, this? Why? Would it ever be in this collection of sharp objects? So you'd have to carry off that level of astonishment. Oh, I can do that. I can do plus that. Plus you'd have to blow dry your hair like that. Eh, you know, I can manage that. How do you look in a denim vest? Amazing. Okay, then I think you picked the right way to go. Uh, I think of all the things here that scream Patrick Hamilton. It is being decapitated after drinking a small amount of coconut <laughs> liqueur. Because growing up Mormon, that's assu- what I assumed would happen to me if I did drink a small amount of coconut liqueur. And plus it happens off screen like a gentleman. Yeah. And, and, right. if, and if a lady attempted to aggressively hit on you, would you have shrunk into yourself like a pill bug? Um, yes. <laughs> I was awkward as fuck. <laughs> um, thank God I grew out of it. Um, so that just about does it for Blood Rage. But before we go, we want to know, Phil, where can people find you? And tell people what is happening with our favorite magazine in the whole wide world, Fangoria. Good grief. Uh, We are putting together our January issue, our winter issue, which I'm stoked about. We've got some really cool pieces coming down the pike on there. Don't have a whole lot of new releases in there, which makes us get creative uh, Uh because movies aren't a thing anymore, I guess. (laughs) Uh, one day perhaps you know so we do a little retrospective stuff we do some cool artwork and uh you know it's going to be great uh we did a new thing recently where we have a weekly newsletter which i don't have some kind of fun url for you but if you go to the top of fangoria's twitter page the pin tweet tells you how to subscribe to the terror teletype it's a weekly newsletter that we are sending out which has an exclusive essay in it each time an exclusive pull from the fango archives of a photo you've never seen before and all kinds of other whatever else has happened in this week in horror excellent people check it out gina where can people find you on these here internets i am a writer over at spool uh that is the spool.com i um have by the time this goes up i will have written retrospectives on near dark and the 20th anniversary of the how the grinch stole christmas music movie which is <laughs> one of my most hated movies i've ever seen of all time <laughs> Uh, and I'm also going to get to review Hillbilly Elegy, so I am, oh. I, I am very much looking forward to that one. So now, let me you, tell you. Will you include in that review the fact that he recently on Twitter told everyone that the moon scares his penis? I will definitely mention that. Yeah, he was really worried that the appearance of nighttime would make his pee-pee disappear. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and I also, I also have my own website at GinaRadcliffe.com, and... I am on Twitter under Porcelain72. Do it today, people. Check it out. Join us on Patreon for uh, Patreon exclusives. Uh, This last month, we had Halloween 2. We talked all about Halloween 2. That was a very fun episode. Uh, We have a newsletter that goes out. uh, We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on Letterboxd. Holy fuck. Hey, (laughs) next time on Kill by Kill. Well, in a week, you'll get a new Dish by Dish, the Hannibal Rewatch Project. Of course, after that new Kill by Kill for Thanksgiving, the episode no one seems to listen to. But this year, just you wait. We've got a real special one for you. It's Saw's Giving. That's right. Gina and I have never watched a Saw sequel. We've only seen the first one. So we asked the audience in all of our socials to tell us which Saw sequel would be the most confusing for us to watch completely unmoored from its continuity. Just you wait till you find out which movie it is and who our special guest is. I think you're going to like it. So uh, that's it for now. But don't worry, folks. The body count will continue. For myself, for Gina, and for Phil, Bye bye everybody. Bye. Bye.